Pardon the interruption, but I'm filling Frank Isola, and I'm wearing shades. So you don't realize I was just on Around the Horn. I'm Tony Kornheiser, and I'm wearing shades because they make me look hot. Oh. These are Revos. <laughs> Did you ever hear a Revo? Yes. These are Revos. And you look hot. I, I think, yeah. <laughs> well, my son got them for me, Revos. And that's enough of them. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, Jose Altuve bounces back. Nick Saban tests positive, and Daryl Morey moves on. But we begin today with the Dodgers bashing down the door to get back in their series with Atlanta. They scored 11 times in the first inning, making life miserable for rookie pitcher Kyle Wright. As fate would have it, Atlanta is starting another rookie pitcher tonight, Bryce Wilson. Meanwhile, the Braves will face Clayton Kershaw finally. Frank, how are things looking for the Braves now? (laughs) Not so great. And I think if you go back to the ninth inning of game two and you, you you know, you always think these this doesn't carry over. I kind of felt like it did carry over. I mean, their first 12 swings that 11 runs in the first inning. And it was somewhat reminiscent to game five last year when the Braves lost to the Cardinals and the Cardinals put up 10 runs in the first inning. It seems like, Tony, how many times have we seen Clayton Kershaw Kershaw Kershaw? Clayton Kershaw in a moment like this where you're thinking, all right, this will be a defining moment for him. Well, guess what? Tonight is a defining moment yeah. because if he doesn't come through, everything that they did up to this point doesn't really matter. Yeah, that, and that's a good point. I will just tell this quick true story that I took the dog out last night at exactly <laughs> 6 o'clock. I came back at 6.35, turned on the game. It was 11 nothing. I thought it was a misprint in the box. <laughs> Because I, mean, I, I what do you mean it's 11 nothing? So anyway, you're, you're right in what you say. I don't know that it's defining for Clayton Kershaw, but he's had trouble in the playoffs, not necessarily this year, but in past years. It's an absolutely critical game, tonight's game. If he does well and they're back in it and it's 2-2, it's fine. But, but what if that was all the runs they have in them? Yeah. What if there was this explosion the night before in the last two innings and then early in this particular game, because I think they left 12 guys on from the third inning on. What if that's it? The, the ace in the hole or aces in the hole for the Braves are Max Fried and Ian Anderson. Let me get these stats because they're interesting this year. Those two guys are 12-2 and two with a 1.93 ERA, and the Braves are 19-4 and four when they pitch. So if it goes seven, you're likely to see them again. I think, I think it's more important for the Dodgers to win tonight than the Braves to win tonight, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Kershaw is 5-0 and in 11 starts against the Braves. The ERA is under two. But why I think it's a defining moment for him, he was supposed to pitch game two. That would set him up for another start right. in this series. Tony, because there are no off days, this is going to be it for That's him. That's it. And now he could come in and relieve. That's it. And we remember what happened last year in relief against the Nationals. That's why, to me, it's so important for him. And if he doesn't pitch well, if he's out before five innings, it's a disaster for the Dodgers. I No, I agree with that. I will give you this great Max Muncy quote. And he hit yep. a grand slam, I think, in the first inning last night. This is It's confident to the point of arrogance, but I, I think it's legit. We know who we are over here. We kind of lost our footing the first two games, but we all know who we are. They're the best team in baseball. Yep. They may not win this, but they believe they're the best team in baseball. Yeah. They've scored 22 runs in the last, last 12 innings. Bats are starting to come to life. All right, Jose Altuve, he changed his narrative last night. Through three games, the Astros' second baseman had been looking like a goat for his throwing errors, but last night he played like a hero homering and doubling as the Astros beat the Rays 4-3. Dusty Baker not only stuck by Altuve, he also stuck by Zach Granke with the bases loaded and the game on the line. Tony, your thoughts on Altuve and Granke and Dusty Baker's confidence in both. Okay, so so Houston is down 3-0 going into that game. Yep. And it looks like they're going to lose. If I'm Dusty Baker, if I'm going to lose... I'm going to go down with my best players. I'm going to be here next year. Altuve and Granke are going to be here next year. So I want them to like me. So he goes to (laughs) Altuve and he says, not only am I going to start you, I'm going to drop you to three in the order. And I'm going to tell you that Joe Morgan, you're like Joe Morgan. And Altuve responds, as you said, with a two-run double with a home run, with a a double that drove in a run and a home run. Granke, who might have been out with another manager at that point, Dusty goes out there, looks him in the eye, leaves him in the game, and Granke comes through with two strikeouts, all right? And he gets out of the inning. So Dusty Baker, 
not an analytics guy, but a feel guy, got it right in both cases. You know, I thought Tyler Kempner in the New York Times wrote up a great point. He wrote about how Zach Greinke, in a similar situation last year in Game 7, he's cruising. Yes. He's got a lead. Yes. He has thrown just about the same amount of pitches that he did last night. He's had about 80 pitches, and he got taken out of the game. The next batter, Harry Kendrick, hits a home run, and that changes everything, and Houston doesn't Don't win. Don't I know it. Exactly. Yeah, because I'm an Nats fan. But, sure. but here, yeah. here's the thing, Tony. It's 2020, and believe it or not, a manager went out to the mound in the sixth inning and kept the starting pitcher in the game. A guy that's won a Cy Young who's earned $283 million over his career. Let the guy pitch. I'd rather lose with Zach Greinke. He's, he's got ace-like material. You leave him in the game, and it, and it paid off for Dusty. To that point, and here's another quote. Here is the Greinke quote after the game. It's nice having someone have confidence yep. in me. Because since I've been here, they haven't seemed to have confidence in my ability. That is a direct shot at A.J. Hinch and Jeff Lunau, <laughs> who are analytics guys. That's right. And Dusty Baker is not that and leaves him in. Now, look, it's very unlikely that they're going to win this series. And all the pressure is still on them until if there is a Game 7. But Dusty Baker won the moment yesterday, and he won those stars back and yesterday. Go ahead. Do you want to say something? I was going to say, what did you make of the ground ball hit to second to Altuve? What's going through Dusty Baker's mind in that moment when they could turn two? They didn't, but he did get the runner out at second base. What do you think? You think that Dusty's thinking, please, please, make it clean and make yeah, a nice throw, and that's yes, what he Yes, he's did. terrified. He's <laughs> terrified. He's saying, make this throw so that I know that the next time you have a throw, you won't be panicked. That's right. Yesterday, a day after Cristiano Ronaldo and Dustin Johnson, tested positive for coronavirus. Nick Saban did as well. The 68-year-old coach of Alabama is unlikely to coach this Saturday as number two Alabama hosts number three Georgia in a game that has obvious ramifications for the playoffs. If Saban doesn't coach, offensive coordinator Steve Sarkeesian will take over. Frank, do you expect this to have a significant impact on the game? I think, Tony, it's definitely going to have an impact on the game. First of all, Las Vegas has the line going from six to four. That tells you how important Nick Saban is. I would think for college players not to look over on the sideline and not have Nick Saban there, and there's a chance that he might not coach in the game, I think that's a major factor. And remember, we could always say Alabama is the one team that could lose one game and they'll still go to the semifinals. But we don't know how this season is going to play out now. With coronavirus, games are getting postponed, getting canceled all over the place. Maybe there's a chance you lose this game, you don't get to the Final Four. So Saban has been a mask guy. He's That's been right. very respectful of the virus in all of his public comments. I don't expect him to coach, although maybe he comes up with a negative test, and maybe he does coach. But there was an idea on the Internet that I really liked, that you put him in a glass box, <laughs> and you put him on a cherry picker with a phone, and he starts <laughs> calling plays. Because you can coach, if you're inside the stadium, you can coach. You can coach from the press box you or something like it. that. Yep. You can call the plays in splendid isolation. It's when you're out of the stadium that you can't do it. My feeling about this is this is a not, a not a good situation for Steve Sarkeesian. Yep. He has been a head coach before at Washington and USC. He was let go because of public intoxication at USC, but he was 12-5 and five at the time. He knows, he knows how to coach. But if he wins this game, people will say, well, it was Saban's players and That's Saban's game right. plan. And if he loses, he becomes villainous. So I, I think this is a real tough spot for him. So you're saying it's a win-win for Nick Saban because if the team wins, he prepared them. If they lose the game, people well, say, see, you need, you need Nick Saban on the sideline to win these games. Well, not only that, no assistant of his has ever beaten him. And Kirby Smart yeah. was his defensive coordinator. It's now 20-0, and 0, Crazy. and the average score is 42-15. to 15. But you can't beat the old man if the old man's not in the gym. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know if it counts if he's not there. Yeah. I think you want him in the Pope Mobile. He could probably coach from something like that. Yeah. That'll work. That'd there. be great. The Pope Mobile. <laughs> Just riding the sidelines. <laughs> Love it. It's a good idea. All right. Big news from the NBA, where Daryl Morey is reportedly stepping down as general manager of the Houston Rockets. Morey thought his Rockets could win the title this season, but they went out in the second round to the Lakers. Prior to the season, his tweet in support of the protests in Hong Kong led to China pulling the NBA from television. Tony, what do you make of Maury's decision, and where does this leave the Houston Rockets? 
Well, my first reaction is, where's Wilbon when we need him? Because this is his <laughs> Northwestern boy, exactly. Daryl Moore. You're probably playing golf together in Arizona right now. <laughs> Look, this is the logical end game from what Maury said when he stood up for people in Hong Kong, which, by the way, every American ought to do. But the NBA doesn't nope, do it and they because didn't. of their business dealings there. And they're going to lose money. So he hid under a bed for about eight months, <laughs> and, and he had no future in Houston whatsoever. What does it mean for the team? It means they're looking for a GM. They're looking for a coach. They're looking for larger players because small ball's gone. That's gone. I'll tell you what. Once the tweet went out, the handwriting was on the Great Wall of China. There was no doubt that he was going to be out yes. eventually, and that's what happened. Yes. And if you remember, it was just about a year ago today where LeBron kind of criticized Daryl Morey, so everyone turned their yes. back on him. So Daryl Morey knew that this was coming, and you, to your point, you didn't see him for months at a time. We didn't know where he was. He was almost in hiding. But I'm going to say this about his time there. He was a very innovative guy, number one. He made a great trade for James Harden. He didn't give up a lot to give a guy that went on to be an MVP, is one of the brilliant scorers in the league. And he kind of led this kind of nerd revolution in the NBA with the whole idea of analytics and also the old school way of doing things. But I think what I've always liked about Daryl Morey was that he was willing to try something. Now, what he tried this year was a disaster. They were way too small against the Lakers, and it didn't work. But I think Daryl Morey, like you said, is a smart guy. Went to Northwestern, went to MIT. He knew this was coming. He, he's a smart guy, and he does a lot of tinkering. And he tries very hard. He had Harden, he had Paul, he had Westbrook, and combinations of them. But if you look at what happened in the playoffs, most of the time they were either first or second round out. They never got to the NBA Finals. Nope. LeBron's been there 10 times. And those three great players I've mentioned haven't been there at all. Well, Let's take a break. Well, one quick thing. Go ahead. He's 240 yep. games over 500 when, when he was there. And they almost beat okay. the Warriors a few years ago. They had their chance. Almost. Doesn't really count. Never got to the finals. Let's take a break. Coming up, the Browns and Steelers face each other on Sunday. Which team is more impressive? And Tony's Washington football team has no. a messy quarterback situation. But did the Giants have a worse one? So I like Daryl Morey. I'm just saying the results at the end of the season weren't there. That Chris Paul That's injury in Game 7 against the Warriors, that was the killer. That was the killer. time for toss-up where I play the role of the Los Angeles Dodgers <laughs> and Frank plays the role of Kyle Wright. What's first? <laughs> toss-up. They play each other on Sunday. More impressive team, the Browns or the Steelers? What's been impressive about the Browns is in their first game, Baltimore destroyed them. And they have won four in a row since, and they've scored 35, 34, 49, and 32, and that's a lot of points. Yeah. And Beckham is finding the end zone. But I'm going to say Pittsburgh because they're 4-0 for the first time in, since 1979, which is an amazing number to me. They haven't played anybody good, honestly. The Giants, the Broncos, the Texans, and Eagles. Nobody even with two wins. But I want to see them at home against Miles Garrett. I'm going to say they are more impressive. I want to see that game. No, it, it's the Browns and a couple of things. It's their best start since Bill Belichick was the head coach. That's one. The other thing, Odell Beckham, he's been targeted 39 times. That's 11 more times than anybody else by Baker Mayfield. So you're getting a terrific playmaker involved. But here's why. Kevin Stefanski, the head coach, you know what's been eliminated from this team up to this point? All the drama, all the nonsense. It's like a soap opera all the time with this team. They just seem to be focused on football. And guess what? Yeah. They're not that bad at it. Yeah, I'll tell you what else has been eliminated from that team. Freddie Kitchens, to your point. <laughs> Next. Toss-up, they play each other on Sunday. Bigger quarterback issues. The Washington football team or the New York Giants? I don't know the Giants' issue. They've got Daniel Jones. I mean, he hasn't been good in nope. 18 games so far. He's got 17 interceptions and four fumbles. But nobody is exactly screaming for Colt McCoy. So if they don't get Trevor Lawrence, they have Daniel Jones. Washington doesn't know who they have. Not a, this Haskins wasn't just benched. He was demoted to third string. They're putting Kyle Allen out there, who has no traction with Washington fans whatsoever. They don't know him. And if he goes down again like he did last week, they bring out a guy with one leg at this point. Everybody loves Alex Smith, but he can't get rid of the ball fast enough. And if they lose this game, Frank, where is the support for Ron Rivera and what he's done so uh, far? That's a good point. And Daniel Jones is 1-14 in his last 15 start. The one win against Washington. 
22 turnovers in 18 games. But here's the problem, though, Tony. The Giants have spent the last 10 years trying to rebuild that offensive line. Watch the Giants this weekend. Daniel Jones takes the snap, and he starts running for his life. He gets zero protection from that team. Well, Alex Smith can't run for his life and get zero <laughs> it's a problem. protection. It's a problem. It's That's a problem. it. Good effort, Frank. <laughs> uh, almost. Let's take one last break still to come. The Falcons become the latest NFL franchise to deal with a COVID outbreak. And guess what? The Clippers have decided on a head coach to replace Doc Rivers. Mm. Do you want to reveal his name or do you want to wait it's for you in the show? Get ready. You're moving to L.A. Yeah. There's an attic out in L.A. you could live in. Pardon the interruption is presented by Samuel Adams from Boston with love. Savor the flavor responsibly. Part of happy hour. Happy time, people. Happy 75th birthday, Jim Palmer. One of the two handsomest men I've ever met. The other was Paul Newman. Each had eyes so blue, you thought they were painted on, but I digress. <laughs> Palmer spent his entire 19-year career pitching for the Baltimore Orioles. He still broadcasts those games. He won three World Series and three Cy Youngs. He did not have the strikeouts of his peers, Tom Seaver and Steve Carlton, because Palmer was craftier, more like Greg Maddox. His career record of 268 and 152 and his 286 ERA made him a first ballot Hall of Famer. I remember doing a newspaper story on Reggie Jackson, and Palmer quoted Dostoevsky about Reggie. Dostoevsky, it's just not something you expect from a baseball player. His idiosyncrasies, like eating pancakes before a start, drove his manager Earl Weaver crazy, but Weaver gave him the ball for every big game. Palmer plays golf at Emerald Dunes in West Palm Beach. I see him there occasionally. He is still absurdly handsome. <laughs> when you said handsome, I thought you were gonna mention Wilbon, or maybe me. But I will say this, what I remember about Jim Palmer as a broadcaster, a little too before my time, even though I know in 1970, three starters on the Orioles won at least 20 games. And they had 54 complete games between the three of them. Nobody does that anymore. Nobody. Great staff. Happy anniversary, Kirk Gibson. On this day 32 years ago, Gibson hit his iconic fist-pumping, walk-off, two-out, two-run, pinch-hit homer off Dennis Eckersley. The one that prompted Jack Buck to say, I don't believe what I just saw. Gibson's hit gave the Dodgers a 5-4 victory over the A's in game one of the World Series. The Dodgers won that series 4-1. It's the last time the Dodgers won the World Series. That was Gibson's only at bat in the series. He was suffering from a pulled hamstring and a sore knee. But that at bat is the only thing anyone remembers from that series. On a personal note, that game was played the day I returned from the Seoul Olympics and a trip to China. It was an 18-hour flight from Hong Kong through Tokyo and Detroit to Washington, D.C. That's a lot of time zones. I watched that game on a small TV in my kitchen. About an, an inning before Gibson's hit, I fell asleep on my kitchen table, <laughs> on the cold tile, ow, boom. I was exhausted. I didn't wake up until game two. Now, I was awake. I watched this. Now, I was at the game when Joe Carter hit the home run for Toronto and they won, which was dramatic. For me, in my lifetime, that's the most dramatic World Series home run. I would have given him MVP. That was his only at bat. To me, that changed the entire series. Eckersley back then, Tony, was absolutely unhittable. And he hit a home run on one leg. Not bad. Yes. Happy trails to the Falcons facility. The 0-5 Atlanta Falcons shut down their facility this morning after a member of their organization tested positive for coronavirus. Adam Schefter of ESPN reported the Falcons had multiple positive tests, but the team did not confirm that. The Falcons announced their operations would be conducted virtually. They are scheduled to play the one in four Vikings on Sunday, but how can you be sure of that? For each team that has to postpone a game, there's a cascading effect on the schedule. Multiple teams are affected down the line. The NFL should consider playing games every day of the week to accommodate the effects of the virus. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday are open. People would love to watch football every night, and this might allow more recovery time between games. How do you do this? I don't know, but the <laughs> NFL is smart. Let them figure it out. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think we're going to get to a point where maybe the Super Bowl will get pushed back a little bit to make up some of these games? Because it seems like that's where we're at. Absolutely. Headed. And they own the stadiums. They can go into May. It doesn't matter. People yeah. want to see it. Two corrections. Nick Saban is 21-0 against his former assistants, not 20-0. And James Harden and Russell Westbrook have been to the NBA Finals, just not with Houston. My bad on both of those. Let's go to the big finish. 
The Clippers are reportedly hiring Ty Lu to be their new head coach. Is that a good fit? I think it's a good fit. He was linked to just about every job in the NBA. He inherited LeBron in Cleveland. Now he gets Kawhi Leonard. Not too bad. All right, the Athletic reports that Anthony Davis plans to opt out of his deal with the Lakers but resign with the team. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. He's able to get a new deal. He gets more money. He stays in L.A. He plays with LeBron. I, I, it's, it's perfect for him. He's not going anywhere else. Bucks offensive coordinator Byron Leftwich says he didn't see what happened when Tom Brady held up four fingers. You believe him? No, no, I don't. Why is everybody covering for Tom Brady? He made a mistake. It's not the end of the world. He's still a great player. It's ridiculous. Cam Newton and Stephon Gilmore. Both return to the Patriots practice today. Is that significant? Yeah, they're really good players. They're a much better team with them. They may not need them against the Broncos, but they're really good players. High school quarterback Arch Manning makes his ESPN debut at 9 p.m. Are you intrigued? Yes, that's Cooper's son, by the way. Eli and Peyton's nephew. I'm looking forward to it. Pretty good. We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. And I'm Tony Kornheiser. And I'm Frank Isola. Thanks for watching. You can get the PTI podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. Ted Bender, thank you. You get a shout out. Ah, there you go. Yeah, golf. It has to do with golf, of course.